Welcome. Glad to have you with us tonight. This is part 10 of the 11 part series of What Does the Bible Say? We have been walking every other week through a number of topics that are happening in our culture, in our community, on the media, through our government, politics, and, and we just want to be equipped. We wanted to equip our Open Arms Church family, other friends, and anyone who's inquisitive as to what the scripture says in regards to these important topics. Tonight's topic is the role of government. There are six questions that if you are on an email list, we sent you those six questions that we look to be answering from the scripture tonight. What is God's purpose for the government? What is God's role in the government? How should Christians respond to the government? Should Christians ever disobey government? How should Christians get involved in government? And will there ever be a perfect government? So we'll be covering those uh, questions tonight, and hopefully from God's scripture, you and I, all of us, can be better equipped in what God has to say about those things. I'll lead us in a word of prayer, and then we will get started. Father, we do thank you uh, for this opportunity, for this series, for uh, these weeks and for these months, to take a look at your word. Uh, there can be a lot of confusion. There can be uh, unrest. Uh, there can be indecision on how to respond and what to embrace or not. So thank you for your word that's clear on these topics that are even relevant for us today, some 2,000, 3,000 years after you spoke to the prophets and they wrote. So even tonight, Lord, um, it's going to be interesting. It's exciting to see that you established government for a purpose. So may we have open hearts, open ears uh, to learn from you and your word and uh, the possibility that as we take in that truth, be able to encourage and guide others who might have similar questions that we have had. In Christ's name I pray, amen. So as we, if you want to, if you're watching and you have your hand out, you want to go online and, and see that, uh, you can see the first question is, what is God's purpose for the government? Uh, we would encourage you, if you have a Bible, to take that out because there are going to be some key scriptures that we'll be referring back and forth uh, to tonight, uh, in particular uh, two or three. And as we answer these six questions, um, we'll be delving into Romans 13, uh, 1 Peter 3, and a few others. And so um, we encourage you to have your Bible with you, and you'll be able to highlight, underline, and join us. So welcome, Pastor Kevin, to our discussion. And if you wouldn't mind, we'd love for you to, to tackle the first question that we have tonight. What is God's purpose for the government, unless Josh, you want to take that <laughs> from the capable hands of well, Kevin. People might not know ahead of time that we do choose who, yeah, we, who's going to address and answer the questions. Yeah, so. we, we divvy these out. But what's great about this is we're looking at what the Bible says. Right. So it wouldn't really matter which one of us answer that. But um, <clears throat> yeah, so what is God's purpose for the government? Uh, we're going to start with Romans 13. Romans 13 is a just a key passage, uh, particularly in the New Testament, in understanding uh, government, God's purpose for it. We're going to turn to it a few times here uh, as, we, as we talk about government. But Romans 13, and uh, I'm just going to, we're going to read the first seven verses. I'm going to read the whole thing. We're going to refer to it again later on a couple times. We won't read the whole thing those times, but it's good for us to, to kind of take it all in at once. Here. So Romans 13, I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. This is the ESV. Paul tells uh, the Romans, so the book of Romans is written by Paul. He's writing to Roman Christians, Christians who are in Rome, uh, which, by the way, was not a good government at the time, uh, uh, and not a good ruler. The, you'll hear the word ruler here. These were not good, godly um, rulers didn't have much use for Christians at all. So he says to them, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist, those authorities that exist 
have been instituted by God. Therefore, because of that, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is, who is in authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Did I? Oh, yeah. Okay. So I skipped. I went back to the same line. Uh, verse 4. For he is God's servant for your good. That, that authority, that ruler, is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them, taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. So with the question, what is God's purpose for government? We see some pretty specific purposes God has for the government. Um, one of the first things we notice is that three times there's this, when he, when he talks about rulers, Paul refers to them as God's servant. I don't know if you saw that in verse 4, he says it twice, for he is God's servant for your good, towards the end of that verse. He is the servant of God. We see it again in verse 6, for because of this you also pay taxes, for the authorities are ministers of God, servants of God. So, you know, I don't know, we don't maybe often think of that, you know, sometimes when we think of the, you know, uh, somebody's a minister of God, we think, well, they're a pastor of a church. But here, he uses the language, he's saying those rulers, those authorities, those government officials are servants of God. Now, they may not believe in God. They may not think they're servants of God. They may say, no, I don't serve God. I serve my country or I serve um, the government. But it's saying, no, God, God, they're servants of God. God use, is using them for his purposes. What are his purposes? There's a couple here. Um, in verse 4, uh, he says that, that, that the servant, the ruler, does not bear the sword in vain. So what does that mean, that he bears the sword? Uh, he is an avenger, it says later in that verse, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. So part of God's purpose for government, for these rulers, is to punish, to bring judgment on, and punishment on wrongdoers, on evildoers. That, that government rulers, when they're working correctly, are... Uh, they're, they're an arm of God's justice uh, on earth and that they're an extension of what he's doing on the earth. He's an avenger who carries out God's wrath. That's, that, that's a, it's a pretty direct connection saying when these government officials or when the government uh, brings punishment on crime, that's an expression of God's wrath on the earth. There's a phrase in verse 4, earlier on I already read it, but the first time we see God's servant, he says he's God's servant for your good. So there's this, there's this aspect of God's purpose for government is to punish the guilty and protect the innocent. So, so to bring justice, to, to punish crime, uh, restrain crime and criminals so that uh, for the good of those who are innocent. So that's one of the, the clear purposes for government that we see in, in what God says in Romans 13. Mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a helpful quote 
uh, in your, actually in your outline, it'll be on YouTube as well. We'll put it in the description field. Um, if this is from a, an article I, f I think we found really helpful from, t uh, from the Gospel Coalition. And the links in there, the whole article would be good. But I wanted to read a paragraph because it really it helped me to think through this. It says, and I'll read it to you, I'll read it with you. According to the Apostle Paul, God commissions civil government to promote human flourishing and to restrain human wickedness. Mm -hmm. So human beings flourish in a context of order and cooperation. Roads and hospitals cannot be built by individuals. They require extensive collaboration. Human beings require peace and stability in order to build such societies and to prosper within them. Therefore, looting, stealing, intimidation, violence must be restrained. Government exists and has been given extraordinary powers by God to facilitate such an environment. It's interesting even in history, or and we see this at work even in many parts of our world today, that, that security and safety uh, is, there, there's an instinctive desire for that among people, among countries. And many times, I mean, freedom is very much a, uh, an emphasis in our country. We were, we were founded on freedom. It's a very strong uh, emphasis, but it's interesting that that many times people will forsake freedom; they will give up freedom in order to have security and safety. And we see that work. Even 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 evil rulers will rise up and take freedoms, and yet people will willingly uh, yield to that because they want security and they want safety. Um, and, and that's part of, I think, that, that human instinct is part of what we see in Scripture. That's why God has provided government to, to provide security and safety and punishment of, of, um, of wrongdoing so that people can flourish. So that's, that's some of the answer of what is God's purpose for government. Um, an extension of God's justice uh, on the earth when it's rightly, when it's rightly practiced. So. But do you guys have anything else to... Let's start. Good. Chime in there before we move yeah. to two. Okay. Um, so, question number two. What is God's role in government? So, we talked about God's purpose for government, but what's God's role in government? It's a great question. And as you said, God's role in government is perhaps not the same as what those in government see his role as, but it doesn't mean that that's not his role. When we think about how government officials uh, come to be in power, we tend to think that the, the most common ways that we view that is that they were voted in, that it's a product of a family lineage, or maybe it's a dictator, someone who, who uh, by force uh, came and took power. But what scripture says is that actually... Um, God appoints. Government officials get to be in power because God appoints them. God is sovereign. He's in control. And he uses and he raises up even godless governments for his purposes. Um, consider a few scriptures. First, the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk. Habakkuk is pleading with the Lord. He cries out to the Lord and he says, God, uh, how long do I need to cry for help? There's all this wickedness around me. There's this violence around me. When are you going to help? God answers Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 6 or verse 5. I'm going to start there. Uh, God responds to the prophet and he says, Look among the nations and see, wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. I might be thinking, you know, if, if I was Habakkuk, I might be thinking, wait, no, 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 God, I, I said things are really bad, so when are you going to help? And God says, oh, no, I see it, and I'm raising up this, this bitter and hasty, this violent nation. Verse 7 says they're dreaded and fearsome. But how does, uh, 
Habakkuk recognized that. Verse 12, he responds to the Lord and he says, Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment. Even in not maybe fully comprehending God's plan, Habakkuk sees, okay, God, all right, your ways are higher than my ways. I may not understand that, but I see that you're raising up this other nation, this godless nation, um, giving them power so as to deliver your judgment to Israel. We see a very similar picture a couple Old Testament prophets back in Daniel chapter 2. King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon has a dream and calls Daniel, the the man of God, to interpret that. And here's what Daniel says in in Daniel chapter 2, verse 37. He interprets the dream, talking to King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel says this, You, O king, you to whom the God of heaven has given the kingdom the power and the might and the glory, and into whose hand he has given wherever they dwell, the children of man, the beasts of the field, and the birds of the heavens, making you rule over them all. You are the head of gold. You are the one who is in charge. Notice how did Nebuchadnezzar get his power? How did he get the kingdom? How did he get his might? How did he get his glory? How did he get that dominion over everything that's apart? God gave it to him. God gave it to him. Both of those examples are from the Old Testament. So maybe we think, okay, so did God only intervene in the Old Testament? Did he only raise up leaders, raise up governments, put people in power in the Old Testament? Well, listen again to Romans chapter 13, the second time we'll go back there. Romans 13, verse 1, second part of verse 1. There is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. What is God's role in government? God is sovereign. He's in control. He uses and raises up even godless governments to accomplish his purposes. That's God's role in government. And, I mean, you read it and you said it, but it just strikes me in verse 1. Every, per- uh, every person should be subject because there is no authority except from God. I mean, that, it doesn't, like, no authority. Um, and we may, you know, I think we may, I, I do, you know, it's like, whoa, Hitler? You know, Pol Pot? I mean, like, Saddam Hussein? Like, how does that work? And there's some mystery there, but it clearly says no, right? There's no authority except from God. And I think that's, I think when we feel that question of what about Hitler, what about Pol Pot, and what about Saddam Hussein, I think we're thinking the same thing Habakkuk was thinking. Mm -hmm. Like, God, how could you do that? Like, um, and God, you know, I think part of what God says to Habakkuk is, I'll take care of it. Like, there's going to be another kingdom after Babylon that's going to punish Babylon. They're like, but that he works everything according to his will, Mm -hmm. you know? And for sure, there's some struggles we feel with that, but no authority. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, would, I think so much of that is from our human perspective, right? Mm-hmm. In our very short time frame, Scripture says that our, our life is but a breath. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's so quick. And so we see what we see, and we read our history books, and we think, oh, that doesn't make sense, but... Mm-hmm. Um, what Habakkuk did well and what's a good example to follow is okay like the Lord he he sees hundreds and into the eternal future the um, never ending future Mm -hmm. I have to submit to that so even in the ways that we may not understand it and that's it's not wrong to feel that way it's not wrong to ask that question like how does that work but at the end of that question comes submission and yielding saying okay God I don't understand it and maybe I never will this side of of heaven, but okay, uh, you, you, I trust that you're in control and that you're at work here. Yeah, that helps us as we think about, I think, the next question, too. Yeah, and, and I there it is, I couldn't find Habakkuk. Um, I think uh, there's this beautiful passage at the end of Habakkuk. Mm-hmm where he, this is the last few verses, where he, it's like he comes to term, he finds peace. He says, though the fig tree should not blossom, though the fruit be on the vines, no fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, the, the 
fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herds in the stalls. That's pretty bad. Like there's, that's like economy collapse. Um, it's not, that's not even hyperinflation. That's like nothing exists to buy. And he says, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. The God, the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He, make, he makes me tread on my high places. So he finds comfort not in a new regime. He kind of finds comfort in the Lord, um, even in the face of a rising bad government. So, yeah. All right, three. How should Christians respond to the government? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, even Pastor Josh, as you spoke about, you know, the fact that we respond from our lives and, you know, living uh, under certain governments. And most people who are listening, who are watching, who are in this room tonight, were born in North America. And so that's even another perspective mm. in how we view governments. Most nations are not democratic, and certainly in Jesus' time, and in the writers, whether they were Old Testament prophets who were under a, the theocracy, theocracy of Israel or in other nations that would take them captive, they certainly weren't in democratic-run government. And yet you see it's timeless. God's instruction is timeless. And um, we see Jesus speaking about it. Peter speaks about it. Paul speaks about it. And the word is, be subject. Be yielded. Choose to come under. And we, uh, we're going to turn to 1 Peter 2. We mentioned there's a few texts we're going to look at, but 1 Peter 2, if you want to take a moment to turn there, again, Peter is living in the midst and the throes and is writing to people who have been arrested, martyred, lost their jobs, um, being tortured as examples to people who uh, were being accused of um, riotous, activity, including uh, burnings uh, of cities, things that are even happening in our culture today, and they were innocent. The Caesar was using them as scapegoats, and Peter, writing in the midst, says, be subject, chapter 2, verse 13, for the Lord's sake, that's important, be subject, be yielded, for the Lord's sake, to every human institution. And we just read, we just understood, this institution was established by God, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him. So that's the type of government Peter had. He was under a Caesar, an emperor. And from that Roman government, governors were established in every regional location, even in Israel. And Scripture is saying, be subject to them. Be yielded to them. Why? You see in verse 15 of 1 Peter 2, for this is the will of God. Many people will have and ask me, John, what's God's will for this, for my life? For and when some people, what's God's will regarding the government? Right here. For this is the will of God, and he shares with us the reason, that by doing good, by being yielded, by being subject, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Now, we've been learning in our study through the book of Proverbs, a foolish person is one who ignores God, doesn't even believe God exists, doesn't follow God, doesn't think there's going to be accountability to God. They just leave God out of their decision-making. And the Lord says, I have a much higher purpose for your life in the governments that you're under. And that is how you live, how you respond, whether they're really good governors and emperors or really poor governors and emperors. He's saying, I want you to be a testimony, a witness to me, even amongst the ignorant and the foolish. Verse 17, here's another command. Under the question, how should Christians respond to the government? Honor everyone. You know, we have offices 
in our country. We have an executive branch and we have a president. Um, we have a judicial branch. We have Supreme Court justices, many other federal state justices. Uh, and then we have a Congress. We have senators, we have Congress folks. And this, this word is talking about those offices. Honor those offices. Honor those people. You may not agree with them at all. But God says, how you respond, your character, God says, I'm weighing that. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. Verse 18, servants, be subject. And, and now he's talking about those who are bond servants, those who are taken, um, whether in battle or those who offer themselves um, in regards to paying off a loan, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. And so there's a question, well, John, is that all the time, in every way? Uh, we're going to answer that question in, in number four. So exhale a little bit, because you might be saying, I can't do that. And there are some exceptions, and we'll see that in the next question. Uh, but in most cases, God's saying, um, be subject in all except a few. Notice, going back to Romans 13, we've covered a lot of that. But the first verse, the first half verse of chapter 13 of Romans, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Again, now this is Paul writing, not Peter. Paul's writing to who? Those who are living in the Roman Empire. Those who are living, who are living in Rome. Those who, are, who understand uh, the type of oppressive government that they were under. Look with me at verse 5 of, of Romans 13. Therefore, one must be in subjection. One must be submissive, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. Again, God's saying your witness, your testimony in these difficult times. For because of this, also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers, and Pastor Kevin referred to that word before, attending to this very thing. And so part of being responsive and subject is to pay taxes. In our nation, in our government, um, they take our taxes out. If you're employed in partnership with companies and how that works with the IRS, if you own a company, you've got to pay taxes. Goods and other products there's taxes on all of that. And here the scripture says, pay taxes, pay to all, look at verse 7, here's a command, pay to all what is owed them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed, revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. And uh, that's the citizen's response. That's a Christian citizens response to their government you know if you recall jesus folks are always trying to catch him in dilemmas um so that um uh, you know he would be cast off or one group would uh dispel him in his teachings and there's one particular person tried to catch him when it came to money and taxes and the roman government um and they asked should we pay taxes should we pay to this Roman oppressive government. And Jesus said, he, he, he performed a miracle. He said, pull a coin out of the fish's mouth. And, and, he, and he said, whose head is on that coin? And he said, well, Caesar. Pay to Caesar, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And here Paul would write about that later. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Pay him his taxes. But then he says this, give to God what is God's. And that's our life. And that's our obedience to him. And here he's telling us, subject yourself to the government for the Lord's sake. And there's something about, um, you know, you might say, well, we have no choice. It's pulled out. I get that. But how about respect and honor? Even when individuals are, um, you know, have declared they're not followers of God. Their beliefs, values, thoughts are antithetical to the word of God. We're going to talk in a, in a few moments 
in regards to Christians' involvement in government, but even amongst those kinds of government officials, God says, give them honor and give them respect because of the office, because God says, I establish the institution of government. And we'll see in a little while that doesn't mean everybody who's operating under God's institution is a God-fearer. Building off of that, I, in First Peter chapter 2, we, we read some of it, but even in the rest of that chapter, which I won't go into right now, but just that picture of um, yieldedness, even when you might be in the right, even when you're doing good, even when you're trying to honor the Lord. First Peter 2.18, be subject not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's a cop out to say, well, yeah, I'll submit to the government, when the government is right, <laughs> when they're honoring God, when they're doing everything justly, God's word clearly says, not only here but in other places, yeah, no, it's not just the just ones. Sorry, that was an unintentional play on words. It's not only the just ones that we need to submit to, but even the unjust ones for God's sake, with an exception, which we'll get to in a second. But um, just that, that very clear picture of it's not um, waiting for, okay, well, when I get the, you know, and that's true in the workplace too, right? The same concept. Well, if my boss was really good, like then I'll work hard for him. It's like, no, you, you work as unto the Lord regardless of your boss could be the worst boss in the history of bosses, but you serve as unto the Lord. So it's a, it's a hard picture of, of humility, of servanthood there, but it's a, it's very clear what God has to say about yeah. that. And yeah, and, and, and then at the end of Romans, it, like John, you made the point that extends not just to the submission or saying, okay, I'll do it, but because, you know, we all know we can do stuff and grumble about it mm-hmm. or do stuff and behind somebody's back, call them names or, you know, we're on Facebook or, or something. And, but it says honor mm-hmm. and respect the ones that are owed that. It doesn't mean they're owed that because they're honorable. Or they're owed that because they're honoring you. I mean, we see this principle in marriage too, right? <laughs> that, that, no, it's, it's, the, it's their role. That's why honor and respect is owed to them because they have a role of authority and they may not carry that out very well. <laughs> you know, they, again, they may not honor us or respect us, but that doesn't absolve us. And I, I, I love this... Uh, you know, there's a series, Band of Brothers, wouldn't necessarily recommend it to, to everybody, but there's a scene in, in this mini-series that just I always remember, and, and it's, there's, a, there's a long backstory, but essentially there's two captains or there's two officers, and one gets promoted over his superior, and he becomes the captain, and he becomes the one that the guy that was over him has to answer to well, that didn't go too well. It usually doesn't, right? Jealousy and everything. And there's a scene at the end where the captain who was promoted and is kind of the main character of the series, he sees, a couple years later, he sees uh, his, um, this other guy. And the other guy won't salute him. He's like just locked down. And the captain, the guy that has integrity and is honorable and got promoted, he looks at him, he says, Rem- he says you, remember you salute the role not the person. And, and it's just always stuck with me. I think that's a good example that we, sh- we show honor to the role. We show honor to the person who holds the role, even if we don't particularly think that they're very honorable. Um, even if we don't think that political party or that particular candidate or that particular um, you know, member of the government, we still have to, with our words, with our posts, mm-hmm. with our conversations, uh, honor um, th- that role. Um, so that's a good word. I think Paul writes to Timothy, who's a young pastor who's establishing churches and calling other pastors, and he talks about be about being prayer, praying for yeah. government officials. Yeah. Why? So you will be at peace. Mm-hmm. Um, because again, they were under the same kind of oppressive difficult government that Peter and Paul writing about, Paul's writing to Timothy and he's saying, how are you going to handle that? How are you going to show honor and respect when they're killing your brothers and sisters and arresting them and it's 
unfair and it's unjust, we pray. Because who knows about unjustness better than Jesus, who's our intercessor, our ambassador. He was wrong. He was reviled. He was ripped apart physically, slandered in every way. But he committed himself to his father. It means he prayed. And he committed those who were treating him unjustly. He says, you do what I do. My father's sovereign. He's got a plan. His work may not be understood even in your lifetime. And that's a charge for us. And that helps us. It's the only way. I personally and many others can be at peace in difficult times. With difficult governments. Governing. Um, that we may not agree with is pray. And God says, I'll help you. But you got to ask. And my spirit will rise up and comfort you and give you peace. The very presence of Christ. So it leads us to another question. Should Christians ever disobey the government? And in, in some ways, I think that question this question is a response to or a, you know a reaction to one of the scriptures we looked at a couple minutes ago first peter 2 13 says be subject and there's a part of us that asks is that is that always Do I have to be subject in everything and just even before i dive into that answer i'm i <laughs> just full disclosure i'm sitting here convicted but ooh, okay um i don't know that i've always um, given honor to the role um, it's very easy for any of us to look at the person and disagree with the person um, and then out of that find reasons to disobey getting to question number four right find reasons to say well I don't agree because they're this um, and God calls us to separate those two things so can, can I uh, just, yeah. uh, just real quick because I was trying to find it when we were talking earlier I think a great example is in Acts 23. And I'll read it to you briefly, but this Acts 23, Paul's arrested. He's, it's, he's, mm. he's going to head through years of legal uh, problems. And he's standing before, uh, this is chapter 23, um, uh, and, he's, and he's brought before the authorities, before the council. Uh, I believe it's the Jewish council. And... Ananias, the high priest, so this is Ananias, the high priest, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. So he says that to the high priest. Um, Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? Yet contrary to the law, you ordered me to be struck. Those who stood by Paul said, would you revile God's high priest? Look what Paul says, verse 5. Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. Mm. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Mm. So Paul walks it back. He calls him a whitewashed wall. Mm. And now it's true, right? He just told him to be hit. And he's being like Jesus, falsely accused. Mm. But he walks it back when he realizes that. Now he had eyesight problems, probably. That may be why he didn't recognize who Ananias was. But He's told, and he's like, whoa. Mm. And he quotes the scripture yeah. and says, mm. you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And he walks it back. I just think that's a tangible example mm. of being mis-treated like treated, and yet mm. yeah. showing honor. So mm. anyway, I'm Again, sorry. for the Lord's sake. Yeah. And he knew his word, and that's what we're studying. That's why we're bringing you this mm. workshop is what does the scripture say about the government? Sorry, yeah. didn't mean to no, you no, that's there. really good, and I think, I think that example—that's a very clear example in just this conversation. It takes this question, question number four: Should Christians ever disobey government? And it's like, mm. <laughs> yeah, just so. Here's the answer: Yes, if and only if authorities clearly command the opposite of what God commands believers to do. Um, I think, again, we're helped in answering that question by realizing our own propensity. And I ought to be really careful with how I I run to look for an answer to that question. There's a few words. I'll read that 
that answer again, that definition of again. Should Christians ever disobey government? Yes, if and only if authorities clearly command the opposite of what God commands believers to do. Clearly and the opposite are very key words there. Why, again, we've been talking about it. Because we're, we're prone to selfishness. Uh, we can seek to justify disobedience because of personal preference. Uh, we may not like certain government leaders. We may not like certain government rules. Uh, when I was reflecting on this question earlier today, I thought of um, uh, those of you who have driven on Interstate 88. You get on Interstate 88, um, you're pretty much by yourself for like two hours. 65 an hour speed limit. It's like, there, I can see the road for like three miles. There's no one here. It's totally fine. Um, some rules can seem, it, it can rub personal preference, but I don't have the choice to, I don't have the right to disobey that rule. Why? Because that speed limit doesn't clearly command the opposite of what God commands believers to do. I may not like it. I may not agree with it. I, I could submit a proposal to raise that. But at the end of the day, okay, um, it's, it's not contradicting something that God has called us to do. Uh, one of the clearest examples in Scripture of this is earlier in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 5, um, showing that, again, the reason for disobedience must be grounded in Scripture. Um, Acts chapter 5, you can turn there if you want. Um, the, whole, the whole account is good. I'm just going to highlight a few verses. Uh, Acts 5, verse 17 the high priest rose up, and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, uh, filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in the public prison. So right away, they're imprisoned. Why? Because of jealousy of those who are in authority. This isn't a really good reason. But that's what happens. Verse 19, during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, notice, an angel is a messenger of God. So God through the angel, saying to the apostles this message, verse 20, go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. It's, it's, a, it's a refresh, it's a, it's a rephrased great commission. Go and make disciples, teaching them. Verse 21, when the apostles heard this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. Now when the high priest came and those who were with him, they called together the council, all the senate of the people of Israel, and sent to the prison to have the apostles brought to them. Jump down to verse 25. Someone came and told them, look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then the captain with the officers went and brought them, but not by force, for they were afraid of being stoned by the people. But verse 27, when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest questioned them, saying, here's the conflict. The high priest says, we strictly charged you not to teach in this name, not to teach in Jesus' name. Yet here you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching, and you intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But notice Peter's response, and many of you might be familiar with this verse. Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. Hmm. Summary, the rulers told them, don't preach about Jesus. Going back to our definition, that clearly commands the opposite of what Jesus and God's messenger, this angel, called them to do, calls all disciples to do. And so respectfully, they said, we have to disobey. Um, what, you are, what you are telling us to do is the opposite of what God himself has called us to do. Um, that's a, a, the, a great picture in scripture of an instance when um, it is permissible for a believer to disobey the government if and only if it's the opposite of what God commands us to do. Now again, with that, it's, it's not necessarily wrong to question things. It's not wrong to, to long for, to look for government accountability. I won't go there right now, but you can read later in Acts chapter 16, Paul has another dialogue where he does that, that accountability, and yet, even in those situations, disobedience and accountability must never be violent. Why? We're called to follow Jesus. We call ourselves Jesus followers. And uh, what's his example? Jesus didn't take up the sword. In fact, he told Peter to put it away, to put it down. Um, what did Jesus do? He spoke truth. Same thing that the angel called the apostles to do. Speak to the people all the words of this life. Jesus spoke truth and he even gave up his life 
for those that opposed him, for those that falsely accused him. Um, In the same way, the Old Testament prophets, New Testament believers, they resisted with truth, not revolution, um, as we see here in Acts chapter 5. Should Christians ever disobey government? Yes, if and only if authorities clearly command the opposite of what God commands believers to do. And even in those cases, our response is to be with truth, with sharing God's truth, not trying to stir up revolution. Um, We talked about it a a few weeks ago. Uh, One of the reasons for that, the realities of that, is that changing who's in power, changing who is in authority, seeking to make that happen, it still won't fix the problem of fallen people ruling over fallen people. Um, Only the gospel of Jesus Christ truly addresses our fallenness, our brokenness. We respond with truth, um, not with radical revolution. Yeah, and sometimes that that truth is not very popular, right? Right, So that's what got Jesus in trouble was Mm -hmm. speaking truth to those in authority. And the apostles. Yeah, and the apostles, yeah. yeah. And the prophets in the Old Testament. But even the prophets in the Old Testament, they're, they're not taking up swords uh, and, and um, going after kings. They're, they're, they're speaking truth boldly. But Yeah. Any other thoughts on that? That's good. Yeah. Um, how, so in the question number five, how should Christians get involved in government? How do we do that? I think I would answer that question in the context of the government in which we live. Probably easiest, can't speak on behalf of other governments, Um, should Christians get involved? Um, We need to understand, too, that in America, the government is secular. Uh, Has been for a very long time. Um, Some would call us a Christian nation, and, you know, that would mean... um, where, you know, every person over, overseas in government is a Christian, a follower of God. We now understand foundationally that many who formed our government were followers of God, believers in Christ. At the very least, because of the way our government is set up, um, be involved. And the scripture tells us in Colossians 3, Whatever you do, I'll read Colossians 3, verse 13 or 17. And whatever you do, in word or deed, literally work, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God God the Father through him. Going and taking a look at verse 23 of the same chapter. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. So whatever job, and if it's in the government, and whether it's an elected position or whether it's a position given uh, because of your experience and an appointment, as a believer, Um, work at it heartily, serving God, recognizing he has established the institution of government, and you can be a positive influence, a godly influence. At the same time, do what you can to see mankind continue to flourish in a healthy way with your influence in whatever government position that might be. Reminded in In Romans 16, 23, as Paul closes out that letter, he speaks about Erastus. The city treasurer sends you greetings. So you have a believer who's working in the Roman government and is um, sending greetings to the rest of the believers there. So as we, you have a, a, a career, a job, whatever it is, that's first and foremost. Recognize that's an opportunity for God to provide for roof over your head, bread on the table, clothes on your back. Um, That's great that you have that skill, that passion, desire, that opportunity. For some, it might be in the government. And 
You know, be a believer. Be who you are, a follower of Christ, a lover of God first. Don't be a, um, a, a government official who happens to be a Christian. Be a Christian who happens to have been appointed, called or elected um, into government. And serve God um, in your integrity, your character, um, as you have influence, as you vote. You know, one of, one of the ways we get involved in government, I mean, when, when government clearly defies God's word, and governments do that, this government does that with laws that neglect, devalue human life from conception to senior to the handicapped. Um, believers ought to be involved in government to influence change um, the best that they can. You know, there were two great examples. There's many examples. But two that stand out um, to me and probably for you would be the example of Joseph in Genesis chapter 41, verses 37 through 46. He was a follower of God, lover of God, bad things that occurred in his life. Now, he wasn't elected by the people to be in the government of Egypt. But God, who was sovereign, worked through all the difficult circumstances of his life, being sold by his brothers, uh, being wrongly accused and slandered by a governor's wife, put in prison, but God had given him a gift. He found himself before the Pharaoh of Egypt. And because of God's favor on him, wisdom that he had given to him, a gift to be able to um, interpret dreams. He was put, <laughs> appointed second in command of all of Egypt uh, by Pharaoh. And Joseph influenced and was used by God as an instrument to spare the whole nation of Israel. More so than even the Egyptian government, which was a, I can't say it was godless, it was, had many gods, but did not follow the one true God. And yet, Joseph served faithfully, with integrity, in the position that he was appointed to. Daniel is another, taken by um, the Babylonians under a godless ruler, and in that role, because he honored God, served God. It's quite interesting. In Daniel chapter 1, he was given many dictates. They changed his name. They told him to read the, 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 the great books from Babylon. He didn't fight the name change. He didn't fight that he, would, he wouldn't read those books. You know what he fought? The food they told him he was going to eat. Because in the scripture, God clearly spoke about what Jewish people were to eat and not eat. And he said, please, how about you, you let me eat this. And if I am not healthier after a few days, 10 days, then go ahead, I'll eat your food. But if I'm healthy, can I eat this food? And he was healthier. God gave him favor because he honored, he knew what God's word had to say. He knew when to speak up and say, I can't do that. But all the other things he was told to do that were quite secular because God didn't speak commands against reading other materials, serving in a government, receiving a name change, other things. Um, he served well. And he served under many Babylonian rulers. They came and went. Um, but God used Daniel and, um, in a mighty way and a great influence. So those are two. And we can, you can read that in Daniel chapter to we spoke of this earlier from Colossians 3 22 um, bond servants and that would have been Joseph and that would have been Daniel they weren't elected they weren't appointed they were taken and they became bond servants in those nations obey in everything those who are your earthly masters and not by the way of eye service as people pleasers but with sincerity of heart fearing the Lord and so they had an honor of God. And so they went about um, serving those under them. And if you're in the government, um, serve. And serve well. Be a positive influence. Even if it's just the people 
that you work for, but maybe even in the constituency you represent if you're an elected official. At the very least, as all citizens, some, most, not called to serve in the government, um, research the values, the voting records of every single uh, government official in your community, locally, in your county, in your state, and in our nation, and compare their values, their voting record, with what God values. Vote your conscience. That's the, an influence all of us can have when it comes to what should our response be to the government. Um, and there, you're having a voice. Uh, you're, be, you're able to uh, quite possibly um, see somebody supported, see somebody in government who is a believer. And you've had a part of that. And there are others who are not believers, but they still have values and their voting record uh, many times are um, close to what God's word declares versus others who are very, very far from what is on God's heart in the government. Other thoughts? Yeah, Responses? just as, as I was listening to you, it just occurred to me too that we, we can fall on different ends of a continuum in terms of how we view involvement in government. On, on one end of that spectrum, on one extreme, it's uh, governments are wicked and evil and I'm not going to do anything, I'm not even going to vote because who cares? And then on the other extreme, we can... Uh, it can become an idol where it's where it's everything and it's all I talk about it's all I think about and and somewhere in the middle God says yes it's it's uh, let's not underestimate its importance but let's not overestimate its importance either and let's be careful that we're not talking about um, earthly kingdoms earthly politics earthly government more than we're talking about God's eternal kingdom mm -hmm. um, so even in that involvement it's yeah be involved mm -hmm. But, and, and maybe you'll get to this in a second here, Kevin, but, but it's also not the end. <laughs> it's not the goal. Uh, it's not the thing that ought to consume our time and our conversations uh, more than anything else either. Yeah. Yeah, and that, so, um, uh, before we go to sake, I, I had a thought on five, two, and how should Christians get involved in government? Of course, voting. And, and that's a unique situation we right. have. I mean, right. the New Testament was not written, it, the Old Testament was not written in the context of you get a, the opportunity to vote, you know. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it is a unique opportunity we should take seriously. Um, but I think, too, it, it might strike, you know, so I, so, but, but working in the government or, or, or getting involved in politics, uh, uh, you know, uh, an election or something, um, I think... Like just, I think maybe the stepping back to a broader scope, even of what is work, like what's the theology of work, like why do we work, mm -hmm. and we have not mentioned it, so I have to Genesis one and two. We haven't <laughs> mentioned it tonight, so I, we had, you know we got to go there. Um, which, by the way, Jesus went there a lot, so we have good, we're on good footing. But Genesis one and you know where God, and we've mentioned it before, but He gives them, He makes them, makes us in His image, and He gives Adam and Eve. Uh, this job, they're to have the rule, they're to have dominion over the earth and to cultivate the garden. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and we, we, I think maybe sometimes we tend to think of that just very agricultural, right? Like, like and we're kind of fairly removed from that. But, but they, they were in the garden, they trimmed things here. You know, apple trees produce apples, right? But have, have you ever been to apple orchard? Like they produce a lot more apples when you cultivate them, mm -hmm. when you have dominion over them and you you reorganize, you organize them, and you trim them, and you fertilize them, and whatever you do to apple trees. But, but and that's a picture of of work. And fields grow better when you till them at certain times and plant seeds in certain ways. And I guess I, I'm, I'm not I'm not a farmer either, but, um, you know, and so extend that out to your jobs. That's what work is about: is us cultivating um, the earth rearranging it, trimming it, organizing it so that more people can have apples, you know, and 
that, that things will work better. So that, that's where we get that, that human flourishing. You know, that, that what if my apple tree could become more apple trees and could feed a bunch of people instead of just me when I take a walk in the backyard? You know, and so it now, now it's not just me and my family, but it's others that are blessed and fed. Uh, you know, if you're a truck driver, um, you know, one way to distribute food is to say, hey, everybody, a boat came into, like, Louisiana, and anybody who wants apples, go down to Louisiana because they came up from Chile. You know, that's one way to do it. But if we tweak that a little bit and we cultivate and we coordinate distribution networks, a truck driver, he's helping humans flourish by hauling apples to New York State in January um, from Chile. And so, so he, he's, he has purposeful work to help humans flourish. And, and you know, and, and, and so rearranging and organizing and cultivating, you know, hopefully um, all of our jobs, we, we can see a way to do that. So how does that extend to government? Well, in government, in a government role or in an elected position, there's an opportunity to help people flourish, you know, to organize to cultivate systems and policies and organizations so that people are helped and served and flourish. But often in, our, in jobs, as well as government, those things are used as platforms for ourselves, mm-hmm. right? For our own power or for our own pocketbook. And that's the wrong vision of work. And that's the wrong vision of being involved in politics. Um, but we have great examples. I think of, um, who's the guy in England? that helped lead out in abolition of slavery. Can't remember his name. Wilberforce. Wilberforce. Christian. um, Wrestled with even leaving politics. He was in parliament. He wrestled with, do I need to leave to be a a, a pastor? And and he felt like he needed to stay there to help humans flourish. (laughs) Uh, Where they weren't. where, Where slavery was... And, and chattel slavery and, and um, Africans being shipped. And so he, he helped in government shift policy uh, so for, the, for human flourishing. So there's opportunities there to catch a vision for that. And hopefully not just in government, but even in our jobs. Not just see it pump, punching the time clock, I'm working towards retirement, but how am I rearranging and helping and cultivating, maybe not apples, but maybe paperwork or maybe flow charts or, or spreadsheets, but how am I cultivating in a way that'll help people? Mm-hmm. Um, so um, to have that vision in, in getting involved in that. Yeah, I mean, especially government. God instituted government. And so he's saying, if, if I instituted, you can be a part of it. You ought to be a part of it um, for good. Because there's a lot of uh, jobs uh, that, you know, have no value to the people flourishing. If anything, exists to degrade people and hurt people deeply. And so, yeah, it is an opportunity to be a part of something God instituted in a positive way. Yeah. All right, so number six, will there ever be a perfect government? <laughs> I'm seeing some... some. <laughs> Some, some no's. Well, let me say this. Though, there's two answers to this question. No and yes. All right. You say, well, that's... Those, those contradict each other. Yes, they yeah. do. Well, you say you're hedging, but let me explain. So no on earth. Uh, you know, I thought of Solomon where he says, uh, vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless under the sun. Mm. Uh, so he's scanning the earth. And, and I don't know if, I don't think government is included in Ecclesiastes, but, but the idea is no, there's never going to be a perfect government on earth. Um, and government exists, let's say two things about that. Government exists in part because of the fall. So in part because of the fall. Because remember back in Romans 13 where we started, that these, these rulers are an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoers. So really one of the big functions of government is there because of sin because people sin and sin big and there's crime and violence and murder and so these rulers have to do their job (laughs) because of sin but the there's but the, the other side of that coin too though is that the governments that are responsible for punishing sin are made up of sinners so, there, so governments are supposed to 
practice justice, but they're sinners. So they don't do that perfectly. So is there ever going to be a perfect government on earth? No, because there's no perfect people. And government is made up of people. And so they're going to do it wrong. Um, uh, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. You know, there's a seed of, of a lot of wrong thinking about government that holds, that holds this idea that if we just tweak or if we just try this model of government, then it'll fix everything. Now, that can go all the way from Marxism, right? Marx had no use for God and had a utopian vision of and a theory, but that can all go all the way to the religious right if we're not careful. That if just, if just the right people were elected, and the right policies were put in place. Now, we should try to put right policies in place, and we should try to have people with integrity, but we have to be very careful that we don't think, well, then things would be perfect. Right. Then that would fix it. Uh, it. It won't perfectly because we're sinners. Mm -hmm. So to Josh's point early, we, we, earlier, we need to be real careful not to put too much hope in government, no matter what form. It is no matter who it is that's in offices office we can't put our hope ultimately in a system or person on earth um, a great quote read this week government government's role is to restrain and reward but it cannot restore or redeem mm -hmm. the government cannot restore hearts mm -hmm. can't redeem souls mm -hmm can't change people's hearts can restrain try to restrain and should but the government's not our ultimate hope so no there will never be a perfect government on earth but yes there will be a perfect government there will be and we see a lot of places in the bible but I'll, let me point to one old testament and one new testament um, uh, passage the first one is daniel 2 we've been there earlier or we were there earlier, but Daniel chapter 2, I'm going to look at verse 44 and 45. So in Daniel 1, Daniel asks to eat vegetables, and that works out well. And Daniel chapter 2, we see him, now he's in government a little, a little while. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, who's a godless king, but he has a dream, and he's really scared about it. He, Daniel comes and interprets the dream for him. So we fast forward towards the end. Listen to his interpretation of the dream. He said, this is what it means. It's verse 44 of chapter 2 of Daniel. And in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all of these kingdoms uh, and bring to an end, and it, sh it shall stand forever. Just as you saw that a stone was cut from a mountain by no human hand and that it broke in pieces the iron, the bronze, the clay, the silver, and the gold. This was part of his, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. This stone will break all of those kingdoms. A great God has made known to the king what shall be after this. The dream is certain and its interpretation is sure. So there's this stone in this visual dream that, that Nebuchadnezzar has, and it, it's cut from a mountain by no human hand. Picture of what God's going to do. Not humans, but God. And it's going to crush all the other kingdoms. And it's going to stand forever. Do you hear that? Mm -hmm. This is a beautiful picture. And, and it's interesting because Jesus, uh, this stone that is a stumbling block. He says this, you know, th th those, I can't remember the exact words. We saw it in Luke, but it, uh, it will crush those it falls on, but those who fall on the stone will be broken to pieces or something. I'm yeah. not sure of the language, but yeah. so either way, you got to deal with Jesus. You got to deal with the stone. He's either going to crush you or you're going to be broken in humility, mm -hmm. um, falling on, you know, at his feet. But there's that, this, this picture, Jesus is going to set up this ultimate kingdom, this perfect government. And then in Romans 21, I feel like we end up here a lot as well, but... Revelation. Revel I'm sorry, Revelation, yep. Revelation 21, so we, 
we talk about the end and we talk the beginning and we talk about the end of the Bible a lot. Revelation 21, we'll start with verse 1. And then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with men, with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. So do you see this government? You see this kingdom? There's a throne. <laughs> and this, this king has people. And it's, talk about utopian vision. This is the utopian vision. Mm. <laughs> Jesus brings utopian vision um, when he comes. And there's no tears. There's not even any death in this government, uh, this kingdom. So there will be a perfect government. And in many ways, um, this is the, you know, every earthly government is just a broken picture of what is ultimately going to be when, when uh, in this new heaven and new earth when we're with him. Uh, and I love the, it's the second to last verse in Revelation, second to last verse in the Bible. You know, when you, when you think about those things, you think, wow, I wish we were there now. I wish we could just fast forward. And that's what uh, verse 20 says in Revelation 22. He who testifies to these things says, surely I am coming soon. That's what the king says. That's what the stone says. That's what Jesus says. I'm coming soon. And then uh, the response, John, who wrote Revelation, he says, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. <laughs> so be it. Like, can we bring that government in, like, right now? Come soon, uh, this perfect government that's coming, this perfect kingdom. So, any any more thoughts, you guys? This part. It's hard to have a better conclusion than that. Yeah. <laughs> Come, Lord Jesus. All right. Yeah, <laughs> that's that's the Bible's mic drop, yes. kind of like just, yeah. Amen. So be it. We want this, but just don't try to get this with human hands. Like that stone was cut out not by human hands. So we got to be careful not to put our hope in human things. Ultimate hope. Um, we have a few minutes, so maybe we this don't. Might be questions. Yeah, yeah. So we don't have the mic, so maybe just if you have a question, just say it, and we'll repeat it and try to. So, yeah, good. So the question is, should Christians ever, um, yeah, revolution? Yeah, yeah. So, so is there ever a, a time, uh, a place for Christians to be involved in a revolution, like an armed revolution to overthrow the authority that's over them? And then if so or not... <laughs> Depending on the answer of that, then how does that reflect on the American Revolution? Um, yeah. And the question was, is there a big biblical example of that? And there isn't. Um, that where believers are told to revolt, they're told not to. Um, but to lean into Jesus in the midst of that oppression. Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And it's a mystery because of what we just studied and because of the taxation and oppression of 
from England upon the colonies at that time. That's where folks would justify. And then they look at the end result, the product of America and how it was founded, formed, and its success and it being a nation that for in many ways, in many decades, blessed many other nations. Uh, does that mean those early revolutionaries were following God's word? It's, it's tough because, I mean, I, I don't, I'm, like historically, I'm not a, like I don't know enough about what, because I, I know there were even many pastors back then, a lot of pastors back then that were, that were um, supporting the revolution and even leading out in the revolution. I'm not familiar enough with, a, with what they said and how they worked that out with scripture. I will say historically, it's interesting because America is an anomaly. Mm. When we talk about revolu- re- revolutions, I think in America, we have a fairly romantic picture of that because it worked out well here. It's an anomaly. The French Revolution, the revolutions that happened in Europe, to uh, every one of them ended up with thousands and even millions of people dying. Like by those who took power in the revolution. They said, we're taking power for the people. Then they crushed the people. Um, And so... It's America, it's, an, it's a little, little bit of an anomaly in recent history that it would be then, once power was taken, it would be used for freedom mm-hmm. rather than oppression. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's not scriptural. Mm-hmm. It's just, it's interesting that in history, I think we do have a pretty romantic view of that um, because it worked out really well mm-hmm. <laughs> in America. Um, but, so yeah. Uh, and again, I, w- I would add too, just um, to to what I think both Pastor John and Kevin have said, that in Scripture we, we see Romans 13. Um, I, if you want to go back into the Old Testament, I think of David when Saul was still king and had the opportunity to strike him down and said, nope, I'm not going to touch him. Um, why? Going back to question number uh, two, that God appointed him. And he, he wasn't walking with God, but you know what? He, he's God's leader, and until God puts me in that position, it's not my place to make that decision. So I think we can, we can see Old New Testament um, examples, uh, you know, of, of historical examples, as well as teaching that more points to um, God's call to yield to the authorities that he's put in place. Um, I, I would be curious to see, and, and like Pastor Kevin said, I... I'm not familiar enough with biblical texts or passages that those who would say the American Revolution was justified. I'm not sure what scriptures they would point to um, to confirm that. I, that. That'd be a good thing to look into. Um, but I can think of many <laughs> on, the other, on the other side and not a lot you know, immediately comes to mind in terms of, oh, well, clearly in this situation, God says, yes, here it's okay. Um, here it's okay to do that uh, forcible overthrowing. So um, just in that, I would, I would defer to that. Yeah, so questions? Uh, Mike, I saw your hand earlier. And, and in that, that, that happened in the span of a week, right? Jesus came in, and, and for those who are watching this recording later, just the, the comment, the observation about how the Jewish people at the time of Jesus saw Jesus as this ruler who was going to overthrow the Romans. Finally, we're going to be free. And the triumphal entry, Jesus entering Jerusalem, they cheered and they waved palm branches, which was a, a symbol of, of independence, of looking for that. They laid their, their cloaks down on the road, which is a symbol of recognizing um, uh, you know, kingly, uh, a political king. And very quickly, when they realized that was what was happening, a week later, they're, they're, they're crucifying him um, because it didn't meet their expectations. Jesus didn't come, as, as was said, to, to establish a new, you know, to establish Israel politically, um, to overthrow the Roman government. Um, he came to, to win souls 
for God's kingdom. And for people then and for us today, we, that doesn't always fit with what we think should happen or our expectations. And that's, that's where we need to take all these things soberly. Yeah, and, 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 the, and you see that picture, too, of Jesus, like, because he's, he's, he is the king. Mm-hmm. Like, he is the king, and, the like, king he's king. bringing in a kingdom. Yeah. But it's an upside-down kingdom, because how he's crowned is on a cross with thorns mm-hmm. and a sign tagged to, a, tagged to his, ex, you know, electric chair. Mm-hmm. And so it's like, what? That's not a coronation. It's an upside-down kingdom where, he's, where he conquers by being... Um, by suffering. And that's what we got, I think, I think that's what I have to absorb. Yeah. You know, it's, it's that, is that, is that, it's not by taking up swords that we conquer, it's by, it's by doing what Jesus did. Mm. You know, uh, giving up our life and speaking truth and suffering and loving. Yeah. Um, and, and, yeah. Uh, Bob, you had, you had, had a quick, Yeah, so. If you, if you read that through, it's, it's good life is an escape from the past, the spiral. <laughs> kind of now that you've read out all the things that took place during the Revolution, that sort of, you know, beyond what you could think normally would happen. Yeah. But all I'm saying is all authority is established by God. Yeah. Literature can hold that if you want to have faith. Yeah. And. Yeah, they should have really like you know just um, they were the they were the superpower right. So the comment was that all all authority Romans thirteen all authority is established by God, and so the col- the colonies could have lost you know England could have come and British could have trounced America revolution over, um, but that didn't happen and so in God's sovereignty He established this new government this new nation and that's right and looking back. Of course, God's sovereign, and just, just as we said, uh, Hitler rose up, and we, we say, wow, I struggle with that. We see America rose up, and we say, okay, Lord, <laughs> like you, uh, uh, looking back, we see his sovereignty, and, and clearly, God established um, America. The, the question that's tough, because it, it's a tough question, because we can't place ourselves in a time machine and go back 230 years and make that decision, uh, and we don't necessarily know what's coming around the bend. So it's hard. So they're both kind of hypotheticals, right? The past and the future. And so we just have to do our best to look at Scripture. And in the moment when it comes, say, okay, Lord, what would you have us do? Yeah. Um, according to your word. That's good. I knew somebody was going to ask that tonight. <laughs> That's good. It's a, it's a good question. Because especially because we benefit like a lot from the revolution, right? So. Yeah, when you ask me, so someone's going to ask that. You asked me, I said, yeah, that's a good question. (laughs) You struggle with that. Hmm. Well, good. Um, Why don't we pray? And then actually, uh, John, would you pray? Close this out, and then I will go turn off the camera. I'd like to, sure. So, Lord, as we um, sought answers, to these honest questions, um, all of them may not be uh, satisfied in our hearts and our minds. And so we ask you as we continue to go to your word and ponder these things, study these things, look to you uh, that we would be people with peace, that we would pray as you call us to pray. uh, First to you, uh, to acknowledge our sin, to acknowledge our need for your cleansing, for your restoring, for your purifying. And then, Lord, how do we navigate um, these questions well in regards to uh, the government that we have and leaders who are constantly coming and going, and yet you never have. Uh, That brings us peace, that gives us help, and that gives us hope. And we look forward to that kingdom that you will establish, Jesus, So we say, with John, 
the apostle, Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, come. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you for being with us tonight. We will see you in two weeks. God bless you.